For our next case, we are going to cover just a bit of the article that summarizes the issue, and then we're actually going to go to the lawsuits that are responsive to this issue. So this is from the AP. This is entitled, Boat Owners Seek to Head Off Lawsuits After 34 People Die in a Fire. The owners of a dive boat where 34 people perish off the, in a fire off Southern California filed a lawsuit Thursday to head off potential costly litigation, a move condemned by some observers as disrespectful to the families of the dead. Truth Aquatics, Inc., which is owned by Conception, filed the action in, fe in the federal district court in Los Angeles under a pre-Civil War provision of maritime law that allows it to limit its liability. Maritime law is in its own little world of special. So general rules have a tendency of not applying in maritime law. So just big FYI. Investigators are still searching for what caused the blaze that wrecked the boat, which remains upside down at the bottom of the sea near the Channel Islands. Okay. And there's a little quote here. They're forcing these people to bring their claims and bring them now, says attorney Charles Naylor, who represents the victims in maritime, who represents victims, not these victims, who represents victims in maritime law cases. They have six months to do that. They could let these people bury their kids. This is shocking. Professor Martin Davis, the maritime law director at Tulane University, says these cases always fall accidents at seas and always looks bad, but it's usually initiated by insurance companies to limit losses. It seems like a pretty heartless thing to do, but that's what always happens. They're just protecting their position. Okay, so that is what's going. So basically, this, this, um, this boat burning down, like, just happened. I, I, it happened, like, three, four days before this lawsuit was filed. So they didn't wait six months. They waited, like, a day, two days to file this. So basically, they ran to court as fast as they could to file a lawsuit to say that they're not liable. Now, from a purely legal perspective, putting aside the moral questions, from a purely legal perspective, I like this move because you know you're going to get sued. 34 people just died in a fire on your boat. You know you're going to get sued. And so you know that there's an ongoing issue. And so it makes sense from a purely pragmatic sense to say we want the ball. Because if you wait to be sued, you're going to be sued by 34 people maybe 34 times. And that's 34 cases that you would have to deal with in 34 issues. So, you know, why not bite the bullet, as it were, and say, okay, well, we want the ball. Instead of waiting to be sued, we're going to sue. So we have the ball. It's, an, it's in one case, and we're going to deal with all these issues all at once to consolidate our, our liability. Now, of course, that may, that may not prevent these people from ultimately being heard separately, uh, depending on the outcome of this, you know, they, that doesn't prevent these cases from being heard separately. But it nice, it's a nice way to, um, to do this. Uh, so it's, can you actually start the clock before liability has been determined? Yes, you can. The, the, the clock on liability starts from the moment of the, liabl the liability-inducing act. Same thing for criminal law on statute of limitations, or same thing from any statute of limitations. The clock starts once the incident started. So it's not once liability has been determined, it's once the cause of liability has occurred. So the clock started ticking the moment the boat burned down. Um, so yeah, the clock, clock, clock must certainly ticked. It's also interesting that you have six months. I didn't know, know that under maritime law because typically in a tort, uh, and this would fall well in the, the uh, issue of tort law, um, normally in a tort you have two or three years under state law to do this, but uh, it's not, not here. Um, Jabberwocky says it could take a couple years before the final investigation of, and of the NTSB concludes, which is interesting since the NTSB could preclude you from investigating. Um, yeah, I don't know. Again, this is admiralty law. Admiralty law is in its own little world of weird. So I don't know the NTSB's authorities, how they do or do not apply to boats. Uh, the NTSB as it applies to planes, the NTSB as it applies to trucks, the NTSB as it applies to anything, is, it's different. Boats, and admir not even just boats, but admiralty law boats. I mean, the law of the sea is in its own little world of weird, so I don't know the degree to, um, uh, if they're in sovereign waters, does maritime law apply? Yes, absolutely does. Maritime law has all kinds of rules for the waterways, but we're going to actually read 
the complaints and we're going to all become more informed about the law. Because I don't know maritime law. I just know this in its own little world of weird. And if there's a maritime law issue, I know that the general rules probably don't apply or have massive exceptions. And it's not a time for me to just like opine from like the, the void, something where I have to go, you know, read it more carefully. So there's two documents that are relevant. They're both very short. One's six pages, one's eight pages. So we have the First Amendment complaint for exoneration, and we have the memorandum in support of the authority for this. So these actions may be a bit repetitive of each other, but we're going to read them both. Manitoba points out that sovereign citizens seem to love maritime law. Don't, don't get me started. I guarantee you the sophists don't understand maritime law. And the reason I know that is because I don't understand maritime law. This is an action for exoneration from or li limitation of liability as provided by 46 USC section 330501 and is a case of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction as hereafter more fully appears and is within the meaning of 28 USC 1333 rule 9H for admiralty law. Sure. Truth Aquatics is at all times a business doing business in California under the name of Conception. Great. Plaintiffs Gren Richard Fisler and Dana Jean Fisler, individually and trustees of the Fisler Family Trust, were at relevant times the actions individuals residing within Santa Barbara County in the state of California and are, and are or alleged to be the legal and equitable owner of Conception, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure I really like are or alleged to be. They're your clients. You know which the answer is, right? Whatever. Which is all time relevant to this action within the jurisdictional waters of Santa Barbara or Ventura County in the state of California. Fine. Plaintiffs are informed and believe thereon alleged that 33 passengers and six crew members were on board the Conception at the time of the fire on September the 2nd, 2019. So as I said, this was uh, filed on September the 5th. So it was three days after the fire. They, they, they balled to court. Plaintiffs are informed and believe thereon and alleged that no passengers or crew members have filed suit for the alleged personal injuries. I bet they didn't because you filed suit as fast as you possibly could. The plaintiffs are unaware of the true names and identities of fictitiously named does 1 through 20 inclusive and therefore they're sued under fictitious names. Yeah, no problem. We don't know who died yet because whatever. No problem. We'll figure it out rapidly. Uh, there are no known liens or mortgages on conception, nor is there any pending freight or hire. Following the fire of conception, only the wreck and wreckage of the conception remains, which is presently located off the coast of Santa Cruz Island. On information and belief, the wreck and wreckage of conception is believed to have zero residual value, and conception is a total loss due to fire, and therefore believed to have zero residual value as a result of the fire. Probably true. I mean, you know, how much value does a boat once burned down have? Not much. At all relevant times, plaintiff used reasonable care to make the conception seaworthy, and she was at all relevant times tight, staunch, and strong, fully and properly manned, equipped, and supplied in all respects, and seaworthy and fit for service in which she was engaged. Okay. On information and belief, on August the 31st, 2019, Conception's voyage commenced in Santa Barbara, California with 33 passengers and six crew members on board for a three-day drive trip. Should, yeah. should, I, should I at this point make the three-hour tour parallel, three-day drive trip? Okay, never mind. Carrying on. On navigable, navigatable waters off the coast of California in the area of the Channel Islands. The conception prior to and at the inception of the voyage was tight, staunch, and seaworthy and fit for the intended trip. The conception was not under charter, had no cargo aboard, and thus earned no freight or hire for voyage within the meaning of Rule, full, of rule F within supplemental authority for admiralty claims, which, as I pointed out, is in its own little world of world. word. Jabberwocky says I'm dating myself with a Gilligan Islands reference. Fine. On information and belief at approximately 3.15 in the morning on September the 2nd, while Conception was anchored off the, on the navigatable waters of the Pacific coast off of Santa Cruz Island, a fire of unknown cause and origin broke out on the vessel. The fire on the Conception allegedly 
resulted in the death of all passengers and one crew member and forced the remaining crew members to abandon the vessel. So all the passengers died, all but one crew member survived. Okay. Passengers are informed and believe they're on that no passengers or crew members have filed suit. I believe that's probably true. On information and belief, one or more of the passengers or crew members have submitted notice that they may assert claims or bring a suit for alleged injury. Yeah, they have to say that because you have to have a case or controversy, and I have personally no uh, no problem that uh, that's the case. The fire and all consequential alleged injuries, damages, and death occurred without the privity or knowledge on the part of plaintiff. It was not caused by any negligence, faults, or knowledge on the part of plaintiff or anyone for whom plaintiff may be responsible at or prior to the commencement of the above described voyage. Okay. Passengers, plaintiff's desire to seek, plaintiff's desire to invoke the benefits of exoneration from or limitation of liability as provided by 46 United States Code Section 30501 at the same proceeding, plaintiff's desire to contest their liability and liability of the conception for any lodge, loss, or damages from the fire. Since the vessel is believed to have no value at the conclusion of the voyage, plaintiffs are not required to post security in the amount of the owner's interest in the vesicle because there is none, fair enough. Plaintiffs will provide security for costs in, a, in, a, in, a, for, in accordance with local rules in the amount of $1,000. So as always, a reminder that when you're filing things in federal court, there are rules upon rules upon rules. There's the federal rules of civil procedure, and then there's the rules of the local court, and then sometimes the rules of the circuit apply, and then there's the rules of the, the individual judge. So, you know, you have to look upon rules upon rules. It's, it's a bit of a pain in the butt. Not more than six months have elapsed between plaintiff's receipt of notice of any claim and this filing of action, and therefore it's timely. Therefore, plaintiffs ask that the court enter an order directing the issuance of a monument to all persons asserting claims. I, I guess it's some kind of notice. I've never heard that word. Monitum. To all purposes, persons asserting claims with respect to the fire admonishing them to file their respective claims with the clerk of court and serve thereon to the attorneys and plaintiffs and to appear and answer for allegations on or before a date to be fixed by this court in the notice. And the court enter an order directing the execution of the monoton and publication of notice thereof in such papers as the court may direct once a week for four, not for four weeks, basically give notice through that, that's fine. The court, upon issuance, enter a order restraining the prosecution of any of suits against the plaintiff which may have already been commenced by any person or entitled to seek damages or for which this complaint seeks its exoneration from. Um, fair enough. This court permit plaintiffs to contest their liability if any for all injuries or damages or deaths arising out of the fire of which complaint seeks exoneration from or limitation of liability in this court in proceeding uh, a judge, the plaintiffs, and the conception are completely exonerated from liability arising out of the fire. A warning of impending danger, a formal notice from a bishop or ecclesiastical court admonishing a person not to do something specified. That's probably why I've never heard of it. This is definitely not a ecclesiastical court, right? But as I said, admiralty law is weird. In the event it is found by this court that liability exists on the part of plaintiffs or conception by reason of the injuries and damages of death, the court adjudicates that such liability shall in no case exceed the amount of the plaintiff's interest in conception, if any, as the same existed immediately following the fire, which would be zero, and decree that may discharge by plaintiffs from any further liability, and the plaintiffs receive such other and further relief as may deem just and proper under the circumstances. Okay. So for those of you who were a little unclear as to what they're saying, they're saying that the boat is worth zero, and therefore their liability is zero. Apparently there's another definition that says, in the U.S., mon monotone refers to a summons. Okay, well, I don't know why they just didn't call it a summons then, but Admiralty Law is weird. This action by plaintiffs, Truth Aquatic and Glenn Richard Fitzler and Dane Jana Fitzler, as owners and owners of Pro Hoc Vice. Uh, the devised vessel conception, Prohoc Vice, for this time. What? 
I've never, I've never seen that before outside of, outside of a lawyer context. You know, if a lawyer doesn't have right to practice in a particular court, they can ask for permission from the court. It's called a pro hoc vice motion. It means for this time. Uh, I've never seen that outside that context as owners and or owners for the time of the dive vessel conception. Okay. For exoneration or limita limitation of vessels liability pursuant to 46 U.S. Code 30501, um, or limitation of the, yeah, uh, provides, okay, the section provides that liability of an owner, provides that liability of an owner for a vessel for any claim, debt, or liability described in subsection B shall not exceed the value of the vessel and pending freight. Subsection B provides that claims, debts, and liabilities subject to the limitation under subsection A are those arising from any loss, damage, or injury by a collision or any act, matter, or thing, loss or damage or forfeiture done, occasioned or incurred without privity or knowledge of the owner. So any sort of thing that occurs without the knowledge of the owner. Uh, that covers a lot of ground. Manitoban asks, are they acting on behalf of the boat? No, this isn't an in rem, so I don't quite know. Yeah. The procedural requirements of limitation action have been codified in Federal Rules of Civil Procedure for Admiralty Law. Pursuant to the supplemental rules concurrent with filing the complaint, they lodge with the court five additional documents entitled Stipulation for Values of Cost, Order Restraining All Suits, and mon Monoton to Issue, which we've decided means subpoena. Order directing execution of the subpoena and publication of notice. Ex party application for approval of stipulation of value and cost. Order directing the subpoena to issue, restraining all suits, and order directing the execution of the subpoena and publication of notice and notice of complaint for exoneration from or limitation of liability. From the outset, it should be noted that the above reference documents are designed to comply with and effectuate the procedural requirements of the supplemental rules. Those rules together with the lodge documents are designed to ensure that all potential claims are brought into this proceeding. Any claimant will have the opportunity to contest the sufficiency of the document on an application to this court. There are no defendants at this time. Upon the filing of the claim or in response to those documents or answers, the claims will in fact become defendant and the action will proceed. Right, so we don't know who the defendants are. There are no defendants, but we want to drag everyone into this complaint. So we have the ball. Okay. The Limitation on Liability Act creates a system whereby the liability of an owner of a vesicle, vessel is limited to the value of the owner's interest in the vessel. Limitation of liability proceedings are governed by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. While Supplemental Rule F addresses many of the distinct features of the limitation proceeding, the limitation procedure can be said to be found almost entirely within jurisprudence and practice. A limitation proceeding is admittedly unusual and unique, but it's an integral part of admiralty law. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. Limitation on a liability dates back to medieval sea codes, and conception of limit, limit of liability is found in the law of virtually every nation. In 1851, Congress laid the foundation for the present system of limit, limitation of liability by enacting the Limitation of Ship Owners Liability Act. However, orientation, orient, origins of limitation can be traced much further back. When admiralty law merged with the Federal law, Rules of Civil Procedure in 1966, the terminology used to refer to plain parties in action under the Limitation Act changed. Before the merger, those seeking to limit their liability filed petitions to limit liability, limit liability referred to petitioners. Those seeking liability now file complaints and are referred to as complainants or plaintiffs in limitation. However, parties in limitation action should not be confused with a traditional plaintiff-defendant scenario. Okay, I'm not sure why not, but whatever. While the nature and terminology of admiralty law limitation liability are unique, the federal law of civil procedure nevertheless provides the same action as law. Only the district court can adjudicate the issue of the vessel owner's right to limitation liability. Citing the U.S. Supreme Court, it is clear from our opinion that the state court has no jurisdiction to determine the question of the owner's right to limited liability. And that totally makes sense because admiralty law is most decidedly an issue of federal law. Supplemental Rule F provides in pertinent part the owner shall deposit with the court for the benefit of the claimants a sum equal to the amount of the value of the owner's interest and the pending phrase, the shall, shall also give issue for cost. 
The phrase stipulation of value is a traditional term used to bear time law for liability actions. The word stipulation does not connote a final decision on the value of the vehicle, nor is a stipulation between the parties to the value of the vehicle. It's only a preliminary determination as to the vessel's value based solely on the good faith estimate and allegations of the complaint. Upon finding a claim, a claimant may contest the sufficiency of a limitation fund. Okay. Any, any claimant may, by motion, demand the funds deposited in court or by security given by the vessel owner be increased on the ground that they are less than the value of the interest in the vehicle, and pending phrase. Thereupon the court shall, due to the appraisement of the va value of the owner's interest in the vehicle, and if the owner finds deposit of security. All right, so right, right away, my number one question in reading all this is the value of the interest in the vessel is not quite the same thing as saying the value of the vessel. The value of the vessel is zero, but if you have insurance, then your your value of your interest in it is for the cost of insurance. So, like, if you got in an automobile accident with me, and I would again note that Admiralty is in its own little world of weird, so this example does not really apply, but let's press on anyway. But if you got in an automobile accident with me and completely ruined my car, the value of my car may very well be zero, but the value of my interest in the car is presumably for the pre-damage amount. It would be the amount of my car as it existed one minute before the crash occurred um, because of my interest in the car. And even if I didn't have insurance in some hypothetical universe where, I'm not, where I don't have a, um, insurance for some reason, I, I'd still be able to sue you for damage to my car. My interest in the car is the value of the car as it existed before it occurred. So, you know, without knowing more, I would think, I would imagine that these people would have insurance, I would think, and if they have insurance, then their, then their interest in the vehicle and the, in the boat would be for the insurable amount, I would guess, but let's press on. As alleged in the complaint, a fire started on the conception on September the 2nd off the coast of Santa Cruz Island that resulted in the vehicle becoming a total loss since she has no residual value. As such, the, ve the vehicle for the purposes of the stipulation is zero. They've agreed to pay a sum of $1,000 pursuant to an admiralty law, admiralty local court rule. This is the first step in the limitation action and a condition precedent. Great. The document entitled Order Restraining All Suits and Directing Subpoena to Issue are designed to comply with and effectuate the procedural requirements. Uh, and in regard to the restraining order, the court's attention is directed to the supplemental rule. Upon compliance by the owner with the requirements of the subdivision of this rule, all claims and proceedings against the owner shall cease. On application of the vehicle's vessel's owner, the court shall enjoin further prosecution of any action. Makes sense to me. Thus, although a restraining order may be layer lifted or modified, in the first instance it must be granted. Moreover, despite the extraordinary appearance of the request, plans are merely seeking procedurally that to which they are entitled under the supplemental rule. Seems right so far. Directed to supplemental rules 4F. Under, upon, upon owner's compliance with subdivision 1 of this rule, the court shall issue a notice to all persons asserting claims with respect to which the comp complainant seeks limitation, admonishing them to file their respective claims with the clerk of court to serve upon, a vote, upon the attorneys. Simply put, the subpoena is a mandatory order admonishing all claimants to present their claims in this action. Makes sense. The remaining two documents described in the section are means by which the court gives formal notice. Documents entitled Order Directing Execution of the Subpoena and Publication Notice and Notice of Complaint for Exoneration are a final step in effectuating the procedural requirements. In particular, the court's attention is drawn to Supplemental 4F, which in pertinent part provides. Upon owner's compliance with Subdivision 1 of this rule, the court shall issue notice of all persons of certain claims with respect to which the complaint seeks limitation. Notice shall be published in newspaper or newspapers, as the court may direct. The document entered, entitled, Order Directing Execution of the Subpoena and Publication Notice, is an order by the court designed to execute and give notice of the subpoena in accordance with the procedures. The document complies with the requirements of the F. Procedurally, players will present the order a copy of the notice. Players then can then publish the notice as directed by the court. Until these documents have been executed by the court, plaintiffs have no authority to present the notice for publication. So basically you're saying, we're going to present you this and let us know what you want to do with it. Fair enough. Simultaneously with filing this, the, the court has exclusive jurisdiction 
It allows five additional documents, each designed to fulfill procedural limitations. Each document complies with the requirements of the corresponding rule and similar forms traditionally used in such proceedings as set forth in the leading admiralty treatise, Benedict on Admiralty. Thus, it's respectfully requested the order issued to the court and thereby give it end of liability. So, again, my, my sort of threshold preliminary question is dealing with insurance. Now, it's, I guess it's possible they didn't have insurance on their own boat just to deal with this example, but you could imagine, like, wouldn't you want a, wouldn't you want insurance on your boat if, you know, it was destroyed due to wind or sea or all kinds of things? I mean, wouldn't you imagine that you'd have insurance on this? Because, I mean, it's a pretty expensive asset, right? So wouldn't you expect that you'd have insurance on it and therefore the, the interest in the boat would be equal to the cost of the insurance? So I, I'm not quite... The way they're citing this law, I mean, the value of the vote vote is zero. I, I concede that, but it do, doesn't quite make sense. The the value of the interest in the boat is zero. I mean, I would presume they have insurance, and if they do, then their interest in the boat is whatever the value of the insurance is. So, I mean, that's something that is not addressed by this at all. It doesn't necessarily have to be addressed by this at all. They don't have to bring that up. Obviously, if they have insurance, they don't want to necessarily make a point of noting that out, that they have an interest in it. Um, that could be something that would be raised by a future uh, person in defense of this action. But, and even if they have insurance, maybe there's some quirk of admiralty law that doesn't give it, give it to them. Uh, someone says, in U.S. admiralty law, the, laws are, the law damages are limited to the vessel plus the pending freight. I mean, is that the way it's written? Let's see if we can find out. We might have to go back to the previous document. Claims, debts, and liabilities subject to limitation under subsection A. Liability of the vessel, the liability of the owner of the vessel for any claim or debt of liability described in subsection B shall not exceed the value of the vessel in pending freight. So then I guess it becomes a question of what the phrase value of the vessel means as a matter of admiralty law. Um, the vessel, yeah, now I don't, again, we'd have to go to how that phrase has been interpreted. So it might very well be that notwithstanding any insurance, that value of the vessel means the actual boat and therefore it um, is zero. So. I, you know, I'd have to go read the case law, to be quite fair. I'd have to go read the case law to see how value of vessel has been interpreted and pending freight. Uh, since there's no freight, that's zero. Vessel itself is zero. I guess the question is if the insurance, uh, assuming it exists, counts as the value of the vessel itself or not. And I don't know enough to, be, um, to know. Um, Zordi asks, or Zordi says, so if someone's injured on the boat, as long as the boat doesn't sink, there's value to sue against. If the boat does sink, they get nothing. So it's an interest to scuttle the boat. No, that's wrong because it does talk about privy of the owners. We did read that before. So the knowledge or privy of the owners um, um, would moot this. So if you can show um, the knowledge of the owners, you can show their intentional act the statute does not apply. So um, so scalping or sinking the boat would not escape your liability because that would be something you would do yourself. Um, so yeah, so sinking the boat would not escape liability. Um, although you could make a credible argument that if the boat is on fire, it doesn't pay to actually put out the fire. So I don't know about that issue or not. Again, that'd become an issue of law and whether that would count as privity of the owner or not. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that there was nothing they could do to put out the fire. 
which seems like a reasonable assumption. Fire occurred at like three in the morning. By the time anyone noticed, it was probably all too late. So that's what that says. <laughs>